Good morning again, everyone. My, my name is John Skibiak. I'm the, the director of the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition. Uh, and on behalf of both the coalition and, and Avenir Health, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning to the webinar to launch uh, what we call the Landscape and Projection of Reproductive Health Supply Needs Analysis, uh, otherwise known as LEAP. Um, I'm joined this morning uh, by the, the, the principal authors uh, of this report, uh, Michelle Weinberger, who I think all of us know, um, but also Nicole Bellows, Megan Reedy, Rachel Sanders, and also two others who won't be speaking today, but who played absolutely critical roles uh, in the development and preparation and, and, and writing of, of, of the analysis. And that's Jillian Eva and, and Judy Gold. Um, this leap analysis um, in many ways breaks, breaks new ground um, on, on, on so many fronts. Uh, the, 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 the breadth of coverage that we have, the integra integration of, of distinct reproductive health areas, and just really the ingenious way in which Michelle and the other authors have tied together so many different data sources to lead us to a common point so that we can compare apples to apples as opposed to oranges to, to apples. Uh, but this uh, report uh, also has very deep roots uh, within the, the history of, of, of the coalition going back to the turn of, of the millennium and the initial commodity gap analysis. And, and my feeling is that <clears throat> that, that fact, um, I think coupled with the drumbeat uh, that we've seen over the last few weeks announcing the, the launch of this, this LEAP report, um, has really contributed to what has been a, a fairly amazing uh, sign-up list. I think this morning I was talking to, to um, my colleagues in the Secretariat, and I think we have something like 176 people signed up for this, this webinar. Um, we have only an hour, uh, so I, I don't want to waste any more time. Uh, and it's, again, my, my pleasure to really turn this over to, to Michelle. The, the webinar is being recorded, um, as all of you will see in the little icon at the, the top of your screen. Um, but Michelle, if you would like to, to take it from here. Great, thanks, John. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, over the next hour, we're gonna provide a very brief overview of LEAP and highlight some key findings from each of the four health areas covered in this uh, new and expanded report, and then save a bit of time at the end for questions and answers. Uh, as we do only have an hour and a lot to cover, we're really just gonna look at some of the highlights, but would encourage you all to continue to explore the report online to find much more. As we go, if you wanna drop any questions into the chat, we will collect them up. If there's just small clarifications, we'll try to get those answered for you in the chat. And then any larger questions or discussion points we can come back to at the end during our Q&A. So with that, I am going to jump right in. Um, so as John says, I think one of the real values of LEAP is it lets us explore these four health areas. And while we present each result separately, they're actually interlinked um, in the background. And so we're able to account for the synergies across these different health areas. So just to give an example, um, changes in contraceptive use, increases in contraceptive use are going to reduce unintended pregnancy, which is going to have an impact on the supply and service needs for both uh, abortion and post-abortion care and maternal health services. And we also look at the linkages between contraception and menstrual hygiene, accounting for the role of hormonal methods and uh, reducing bleeding and then having an effect on the menstrual hygiene product needs for those women. And so while we look at each set of results separately, um, we do kind of have them all interconnected and, and relating to each other. So in LEAP, we start by looking at the people who need and use each of the different health products being considered. We then look at the quantities of the drugs or supplies that they use. Uh, this is in gray because while this is a, a key result to um, calculate and get to our costs, we don't focus on this so much in the landscape reports, but some forthcoming custom reports uh, will 
give you access to, to that data. And we'll come back and talk about that more at the end. And then we look uh, probably most importantly at the cost of these drugs and supplies. We do this both for a current landscape and in LEAP we've chosen to focus our current landscape on 2019 as we wanted to sort of ground our, our current world before um, COVID-19 as we know that the last year and a half has been atypical due the, to the pandemic and don't really, didn't feel like we had enough data to really um, truly understand what that impact is. So we're sort of grounding ourselves in 2019 and then project forward looking at a 2025 and a 2030 endpoint. For contraception, you'll see as with the previous reports, we, we project forward a single trajectory uh, into the future. But for the new health areas, we explore three scenarios of increases, which we'll talk you through today. Our estimates focus on 129 low and middle income countries. Our calculations are all done at the country level and then aggregated up. And today we'll be presenting results grouped into these through three different income groups, low income, lower middle income, and upper middle income uh, as defined by the World Bank based on the GNI per capita in each country. So you can go to LEAP online at leap.rhsupplies.org. Um, the report is, really comes alive through this interactive website. If you navigate uh, across the top of the report, those different tabs will bring you to the landscapes for each of the different health areas. So you'll find uh, a, a sort of similar structure of report for each of them, but each, each story is, is told separately. And then in the top corner is our reader's guide. And if you click that, the reader's guide will pop up. The reader's guide provides lots of additional information about the methods and the data sources and interpretation of the results. So you'll find a sort of overall reader's guide with some key information that holds true across LEAP. And then each of the individual health areas has a detailed reader's guide providing methodology and data sources used for those. So that's a place to go if you really wanna understand what sits behind the numbers. So finally, just a word on our approach. Um, as John mentioned, I think one of the real uh, value add that we get out of LEAP when building on, a, on the methodology developed for the contraceptive gap analysis is being able to really utilize and bring together a wide range of different data sources. So I'm not going to get into all the details um, in this diagram, but we just wanted to illustrate kind of the breadth and depth of data being used. And here we've kind of grouped our data sources into four different types of data. We use uh, a lot of existing projections from the UN Population Division, which help really provide the demographic foundation to our modeling work. We do a huge amount of secondary analysis of household surveys like DHS and Mix and PMA. And this lets us look at the use of different supplies and services. So for example, method mix uh, for contraceptive users, the mix of menstrual hygiene products being used or things like facility delivery for maternal health. We draw on a wide range of price and volume data. Uh, this is most extensive, as you can see, for contraception, building on work that's been developed over the last couple of commodity gap analyses to look more into the role of out-of-pocket expenditures uh, within the private sector. And for the new health areas, we uh, have a more limited range of price data, mostly due to the more limited availability of data for these supplies. And then finally, we draw on existing modeling and research to help inform our estimates. This is particularly true uh, for the abortion and post-abortion care and maternal health estimates, given the complexity of those areas. So with that, I'm going to uh, give us a quick overview of the results for contraception and then pass on to my uh, colleagues and co-authors to take us through the other three areas. So for those of you who are familiar with the past commodity gap analyses, you'll see that these results look pretty similar to what's been presented in the past, but everything has been updated with the newest and latest data sources. Also, just a quick note that the countries that we include have changed. Uh, most notably, we are now including China. And so it means that the results from this report can't be compared to results from previous LEAP reports. So there are 103 million contraceptive users across low and middle income countries. And this graph shows how those users are segmented out uh, by where they go for their method. The first bar are those who get their method from the public sector. And the second bar is, are those who get their method from the private sector. 
And then the colors within the bars show us what methods that women are using. We see that just over half of women are using short acting methods, but that at individual method level, sterilization is the most widely used method. Overall, about six out of every 10 women obtain their method from the public sector. And if we look into the mix of methods uh, among those using the public versus private sector, we see distinct patterns. And we can see this by changing this graph, which right now is showing us absolute numbers into a relative view. And you'll see online that most of our graphs are interactive in this way that let you sort of toggle these two different views. And so now what we're looking at is the method mix within each of these two sectors. And we see that it, in the public sector, the vast majority of women are using a long acting or permanent method. And by contrast, the majority of women in the private sector are using short acting methods. These distinct roles reflect in part differences in the health infrastructure in each country. So in many countries, the private sector is dominated by pharmacies and drug shops that might provide a more limited range of supplies. But there also might be other policy or financial barriers, both on the side of the client and on the side of the provider that are affecting this pattern as well. And while these distinct patterns hold true across low and middle income countries, some individual countries may be an exception to this. So there may be countries where we see more similar method mixes between the two. So this graph gives us uh, a lot of different useful information about where users live and where they obtain their methods. So let's start by looking at the width of the bars. The width of the bars shows us the share of women who live within each income group. So we see that upper middle income countries have the widest bar. Nearly 60% of users are living within upper and middle income countries. And by contrast, just 5% of users live in low income countries. This is a function both of the number of countries that fall into each income group, as well as the size of those countries. So next, if we look at the stacking on the bar, these colors tell us about where women are going. We see that more than half of users go to the public sector across all three income groups, but that the role of the public sector diminishes. So a larger share of low income women are going to the public sector as compared to lower middle and upper middle income. However, given the larger number of users in upper middle income countries, in absolute terms, there are more public sector users uh, in upper middle income countries than the other two income groups, which we can see by the size of the orange square. So here we're looking a bit into the patterns that sit behind each of the three income groups. This graph shows us the top five countries in terms of user numbers uh, within each of the income groups. So we see in low income countries that Ethiopia holds the largest share, but that users are fairly evenly distributed across the top five countries. But by contrast, in lower middle and upper middle income country, a single country, so India in lower middle and China in upper middle, accounts for more than half of the users in these income groups. And so therefore, when we're looking at patterns across income groups, it's important to keep in mind the influence of these individual countries. The current cost of contraceptive supplies is estimated at 3.87 billion across low and middle income countries. As seen by the large purple bar in the graph, this is primarily driven by users purchasing pills from the private sector. So they account for 2.44 billion of that total. This cost is highly concentrated in upper middle income countries. This income group accounts for 58% of users, but 78% of costs. And the reason for this is because cost is not simply a function of use. There are lots of different things driving this pattern, including the larger, higher use of the private sector in upper middle income countries, differences in method mix across countries and sectors. And we see that in many upper, in, upper middle income countries, there are relatively higher unit costs for contraceptive methods. So a quick look into the future. We align our future growth projections to the UN population division median estimate for the total number of contraceptive users. And then we layer in projected shifts in the methods that women are using informed by recent changes in survey data. So what this tells us is what the world would look like if these current patterns persisted. And we know that there might be lots of reasons for those patterns not to persist, but this gives us a useful starting point to think about the future. So if current patterns change, we'd see that while the overall number of users is projected to grow, this growth would be uneven across methods. 
Most notably, given recent growth in the use of implants, implants would be projected to see the most rapid growth going into the future in both absolute and relative terms, growing by more than 200% and gaining more than 60 million users between 2019 and 2030. However, despite this rapid growth, they would still only account for 11% of the method mix in 2030, meaning that many other methods are still playing an important role. And then finally, as the number of users change, so too will the methods that they use and the costs of those methods. And so here we look at the change in the supply cost across income groups if these patterns were to persist. In low-income countries, we would see the fastest growth in relative terms with a 78% increase in costs from 2019 to 2030, while in lower middle-income countries, we would see the largest gain in absolute terms, increasing by 236 million over the same time period. In upper middle income countries, by contrast, things would relatively stagnate. So this has been a really quick overview of some of the key findings from the contraception report. And I encourage you to look at the full report online for more. And with that, I will pass over to my colleague, Nicole, to talk us through menstrual hygiene findings. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so similarly, we'll just do sort of some of the highlights of the menstrual hygiene findings. Next slide. So as Michelle mentioned, we combined population data as well as data on fertility and contraceptive use to estimate approximately 1.67 billion menstruators living in low and middle income countries. And so for this analysis, we examined what proportion of menstruators are using what we call purpose-made menstrual hygiene products. So these are products that are made explicitly for the purpose of capturing menstrual blood, including disposable pads and tampons, as well as reusable pads, underwear, and cups. Um, we recognize that many menstruators use other types of products during menstruation, um, such as reusable cloth, um, but there's very little data available on reusable cloth and other types of um, products. And so we limit our analysis to those uh, listed here. In examining the use of these products, we can see that the proportion of menstruators using purpose-made products uh, varies by income group, with 39% of menstruators in low-income groups using purpose-made products compared to 62% in the lower-middle-income countries and 90% in the upper-middle-income countries. So as we saw with contraceptive users, uh, the overall use of purpose-made menstrual hygiene products is tied to population size, with India making up 45% of use in the lower middle income category, and China with 46% in the upper and middle income category. The low income group is more evenly distributed, led by Ethiopia with 20%, and then followed by DRC and Uganda. Although there are many organizations that are working to increase access to reusable products, meaning those reusable pads, underwear, and cups, there are little data on the use of these products. And from the little data that we have seen, we uh, use the assumption in our analysis that 5% of purpose-made product use is for reusable products. So this low level of use coupled with lower annual unit costs for reusable products results in current estimates of approximately 2% of total costs for reusable products and 98% for disposable. As you can see in the graph, the absolute costs are substantially different by income group with the 28 billion um, of total costs for 2019 dominated by the upper middle income countries, which make up approximately 63% of total costs. So in generating our projections of these menstrual hygiene commodity needs to 2030, we looked at three potential scenarios. Our first scenario is maintain product use, where the estimates on the proportion using purpose-made products uh, remains the same, but the demographics as well as contraceptive use and fertility rates um, can change and those, those changes are accounted for. The second scenario allows for increases in the use of these purpose-made products. Um, within a geographic region, we projected an increase in product use by assuming that by 2030, the low-income countries would achieve the use of lower middle-income countries within that same region, 
and the lower middle income countries would achieve the use of the upper middle income countries. Upper middle income countries, uh, which we've seen already have high use rates, would make modest gains um, by achieving the rate of the highest upper middle income country within that region. For our third scenario, we use these same increases that I described in scenario two, but the primary difference is that the proportion of menstruators using reusable purpose-made products increases to 25% by 2030. And we recognize this would be a major shift in the market. Here you can see how the proportion of menstruators using purpose-made products in 2030 varies by the three scenarios by income group. For low-income countries, one can see substantial increases in menstruators using products um, from 39% up to 71% in scenarios two and three. The lower middle income countries also see substantial gains under these increasing scenarios. And then there are more modest gains as, as mentioned for the upper middle income countries. Finally, in our third scenario, we see these major gains in the proportion of using reusables in each group, which you can see by the growth in that red bar. When we look at the users of disposable products under these scenarios, there's a substantial increase under scenario two, which is expected given the rise in the proportion of people using purpose-made products. Um, but interestingly, under scenario three, we see that the number of disposables is approximately the same in the first scenario, um, since the increase in the proportion of product use is absorbed by this shift to reusables. So this has some interesting implications. Next slide. And looking at the total cost projections, we see a substantial increase from scenario one to two. Again, this is uh, expected due to this increase in product use. Um, but then some of these costs are partially recovered in scenario three due to this shift to reusables, which have a lower annual per person cost. When breaking down the cost by income group, we can see that the biggest cost increases are for the lower middle income countries, where there is a large portion of the population and sizable increases in the proportion using purpose-made products. Increases are also shown for low income, low income countries, where the upper middle income countries have a projected decrease in costs under scenario one. This is due to changes in the number of menstruators expected over time. And then this decrease is even greater in scenario three with that shift to reusable products. So those are some of the brief highlights on men menstrual hygiene. Um, now I'm gonna hand things off to Rachel Sanders. Thank you, Nicole. I'll be taking us through an overview of the maternal health component of the analysis. Uh, just to give us a bit of background and bring us all to the same page, I think most people know that despite substantial gains, maternal mortality does remain high. From 2000 to 2017, the global maternal mortality ratio declined by 38% from 342 deaths to 211 deaths per 100,000 live births. This translates into an average annual reduction of 2.9%. While substantive, this is less than half the 6.4% annual rate needed to achieve the sustainable development goal, which was set at 70 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. Next slide, please. This analysis focuses in on priority maternal health drugs to help to achieve these goals of reducing maternal mortality. Postpartum hemorrhage and preeclampsia and eclampsia are the two leading causes of maternal deaths, accounting for 40% of all maternal deaths. Other major causes include hypertension, infection, and unsafe abortion, covered by different components of this analysis. Most of these complications can be prevented or treated if women have access to skilled care, including appropriate facilities and drugs during and after pregnancy and childbirth. Given this information, this analysis focuses in on seven priority drugs and layers in two emerging drugs. So the seven core emerging drugs include iron and folic acid during pregnancy, hydralazine and methyl dopa for hypertension management, magnesium sulfate for preeclampsia and eclampsia treatment, 
uterotonics, including oxytocin and mesoprostol to prevent and treat PPH and metronidazole for maternal infection treatment. In our look toward the future, we also include these two emerging drugs, heat-stable carbitocin for PPH for um, postpartum hemorrhage prevention and tranexamic acid for postpartum hemorrhage treatment. Next slide, please. So in 2019, there were 332 million cases or instances when a woman needed one of these drugs and 132 million based on our estimates where they actually received them. The calculation of these cases is based on numbers of pregnancies and births, going back to the um, analysis that uh, Michelle presented first, um, and then estimating the numbers of uh, those pregnancies or births which might need the service or drug, and then the coverage or percent receiving in order to calculate how many women actually get the drug. And we call each of these a case which we define as a health intervention to prevent, manage, or treat complications during pregnancy or childbirth that uses one of the maternal health drugs under review. So by focusing in on cases, we're able to account for the fact that one pregnant woman may receive multiple interventions um, that, that use the same drug or multiple drugs for different conditions. So oxytocin, for example, could be used during the course of a single pregnancy for multiple things. And a woman could also, and typically would receive, for example, iron and folic acid during pregnancy, as well as other drugs during childbirth to, um, to help to manage various conditions. Additionally, um, as part of the cost estimates, we do reflect on the number of doses or units of each drug that are required for proper treatment um, of the condition. Next slide, please. So in generating projections to 2030, much like what Nicole just described for menstrual hygiene, we look at three potential scenarios. In the first, we maintain coverage. So this scenario accounts for changes in the number of pregnancies and births and maintains current levels of intervention coverage. And this provides us with a good baseline for comparison, although we hope that there will be greater achievements in terms of coverage of women needing care. And in the second scenario, we reflect that increase in coverage. It accounts for the same changes in the numbers of pregnancies and births as seen in scenario one, but increases coverage of the included interventions to reach the coverage in the next highest income group by the final year. So for example, low income countries move up to lower middle, lower middle countries move up to the status, the, um, status of upper middle income countries by the final year, and upper middle income countries shift to the highest achieved coverage within that group by 2030. And um, where coverage in any given country already met or exceeded the next income level up, it was held constant. Last but not least, in our scenario three, we both incorporate the increases in coverage seen in scenario two, but also look at some potential shifts to incorporate emerging drugs. So uh, while coverage of each given intervention is the same as in scenario two, we are looking at scale up of heat stable carbitocin and the addition of tranexamic acid in the facility births. Next slide, please. Based on the changes in the numbers of pregnancies and births, the numbers of cases receiving the needed drugs will change over time, even if coverage is maintained at current levels as envisioned under scenario one, which you can see in this slide here in the, um, the reddish line. Um, when that's coupled with the increases in intervention coverage that are included in scenario two, more dramatic changes can be seen. While in scenario three, which layers in the scale up of the emerging drugs, we see shifts in what's actually being used. So the biggest um, implication of these changes is that oxytocin would see the largest increase under scenario two. However, when we compare that with scenario three, we can see that it's offset by the scale up of heat stable carbitocin. So depending on how things play out, we, uh, over time with these drugs, we could see a very different picture, particularly for uterotonics. Um, next slide, please. Moving to the cost implications of the analysis, we're estimating that at baseline, the costs of these seven drugs would be around $103 million. 
the cost increases seen in scenario one would be relatively limited due solely to increasing numbers of pregnancies and births, rising to about 110 million. If we build in the increases in coverage to the levels envisioned under scenario two, we would see costs increase more rapidly, growing by 60% from 103 million to 166 million by 2030. At the same time, if we also looked at the scale up of heat stable carbatosin and tranexamic acid, costs would increase to 180 million by 2030, reflecting the trade offs between oxytocin and heat stable carbatosin um, and the additional costs from cases receiving tranexamic acid. Next slide, please. Um, if we look at a breakdown by income level, the largest absolute cost increase would be in lower and middle income countries due to coverage expansion and the numbers of pregnancies and births. If we think about the percentage increase, the greatest increase would be in low income countries due primarily to the low starting point. So even a relatively modest increase in absolute number still has pretty big implications relative to the starting point. Um, so in scenario two, low income countries would see costs increase by about 17 million by 2030 and um, by about 20, by about 19 million in scenario three from their starting point of 10 million. Lower and middle income countries would see an approximately $30 million increase in scenario two, rising to 36 million in scenario three in terms of the absolute increase. And then upper middle income countries would still see a substantial increase, but lower than lower middle income countries, about a $17 million increase in scenario two and an additional $21 million needed in scenario three. I should say that when I'm providing these absolute numbers um, of increase, it's in comparison to their baseline. So it's not an additional 21 million over scenario two and scenario three, it's 21 million over baseline. So if anyone would like to explore these in more detail, you can dig into information about individual drug items in the online report, incidents and prevalence estimates, all the background. We'd encourage you to explore and please be in touch if there are questions or comments. Thank you. At this point, I am going to pass to my colleague, Megan Reedy, to take us through the abortion and post-abortion care component. Thanks, Rachel. Next slide, please. The variation in access to abortion access, as well as stigma of these services, has created great variability in the safety of abortion services. The World Health Organization uses the following classification of abortion safety. Those safe abortions are abortions that are both provided by an appropriately trained person and carried out using a surgical or medical method recommended by the WHO appropriate to the pregnancy gestation. Less safe abortions meet only one of these two criteria, and least safe abortions meet neither of the two criteria. They are provided by untrained people using dangerous methods such as toxic substances or insertion of sharp objects. In LEAP, we have modeled all three types of abortions, as well as post-abortion care services. However, we have only costed a subset of more supplied ribbon services. This includes safe and less safe abortions, as well as post-abortion care services that use medical methods and vacuum aspiration. We have not costed least safe abortions and surgical services using dilation and curatage and dilation and evacuation. Throughout the report, we refer to the number of services as one woman may receive multiple services. Next slide, please. For our 2019 baseline, we have modeled a total of 72.5 million abortions and post-abortion care services, including all safety types and methods. Looking across the income groups, the distribution of services is broadly reflective of the distribution of women of reproductive age. And the majority of these services are abortions. Next slide, please. Looking at the distribution of services by method across the income groups, the share of costed services increases with income where least safe abortions, represented here in the dark gray bar at the top, account for 30% of services in low-income countries 
but only 5% of services in upper middle income countries. Across all income groups, medical methods using mesoprostol or a combination of mesoprostol and mifepristone make up the largest share of services. Next slide. We have modeled a total of $226 million in supply costs, which is primarily driven by the cost of mesoprostol, here seen in the darker pinkish bars. Medical methods account for 90% or more of total supply costs, while vacuum aspiration, which only includes the cost of the MVA kit, is a very small share. There is wide regional variation in the price of mesoprostol, and if all mesoprostol were to cost the same as the median cost in Asia, the total cost of supplies would decrease by 43%. Next slide, please. Looking towards changes ahead, we analyzed three potential future scenarios. The first scenario only includes the demographic and contraceptive use changes from the other sections of the LEAP analysis. No changes were made to the distribution of the safety profile of services or mix of surgical and medical methods. The second scenario takes the first and improves the safety profile of services, decreasing the proportion that are least safe and increasing the proportion that are safe. The third scenario takes the safety improvements from the second scenario and adds in a shift to a greater use of medical methods, particularly using a combination of mesoprostol and mifepristone. Next slide, please. Here you can see the impact of these changes in each income group with the first bar representing the no change scenario, the second representing the shift in safety scenario, and the third representing the shift in safety and method mix scenario. In all three income groups, the share of services that are least safe abortions decreases in scenarios two and three. We'll explore in detail on the next slide the changes in the number of costed services by method. The, while the total number of abortion services increases by the same magnitude in all three scenarios, what differs is the change in abortion post-abortion care services based on the shifts in safety profile and method mix. However, the general pattern of change in total abortion and post-abortion care services is similar in all three scenarios. With no changes in the safety profile or method mix as seen in scenario one, the number of vacuum aspiration and medical services would both only slightly increase. A more substantial increase in surgical aspiration services would be seen if there was a shift in the safety profile, but the method mix did not change as um, illustrated in scenario two seen here in green. However, more than half of the increase in surgical services would be offset if the method mix also shifted towards medical methods using mifepristone as seen in scenario three here in purple. Next slide. Looking at the impact of these changes on supply costs, you can see substantial differences in the three scenarios and the change in costs between 2019 and 2030. In scenario one, the costs would remain virtually unchanged. Scenario two could lead to slight increases in costs as a larger share of services are safe or less safe and get included in the cost of services. Scenario three's shift in both safety and method mix with more mifepristone could lead to much higher costs if there is not an accompanying decrease in the price of mifepristone between now and 2030. Such a decrease is very possible as, as misoprostone becomes approved in more countries and demand increases. There's potential for increased competition to drive down supply costs. Next slide, please. Another way that supply costs could potentially be reduced is through co-packaging of mesoprostol and mifepristone into combi packs. Currently, the lowest regional median price of, for combi packs is $3.54 in Asia. If combi packs at this price were available everywhere, the supply cost of services with mesoprostol and mifepristone would be cut almost in half. And with that, those are the brief highlights of abortion and post-abortion care. And now I will turn it back over to Michelle. Michelle, you are muted. Sorry, I was having trouble getting to the unmutes. <laughs> 
Uh, great. Thank you very much, Megan. So that was a very quick overview uh, across these four different health areas. I see that the uh, link to the report has been put into the chat, so I would encourage you all to go there uh, and explore things further, um, both in terms of uh, the narrative that, it, that kind of tells the story of each of, each of these different health areas, but also being able to um, interact and engage with the, the graphics uh, and figures throughout the report to get more in-depth understanding. We also wanted to plug that um, coming soon, we'll be launching a series of custom reports, which will let users explore country and regional results in more detail for each of the three, or sorry, each of the four health areas, there will be three different custom reports available. Uh, one that allows for comparing or looking at a landscape across a single country or region, one that allows for a comparison of results uh, across countries or across regions, and then one that is really aimed at giving a deep dive into a single supply or single drug for those users that are really interested um, in, a, in a single product and thinking about where that product is and, and how um, volumes and prices might be changing over time. So with that, uh, I will bring us back for a question and answer. I see that um, lots have been coming in over the chat. So just give one second. Um, great. So maybe we can start, uh, I saw there was a, a question about cost, and maybe I will start on that one because it's sort of cross-cutting um, across all of the different um, all of the different health areas and then maybe open it up for some more specific discussions uh, of some of the um, different health areas. Um, so the, we use the term cost uh, throughout this report because we wanted to have sort of a, a way to talk a, about our results across all the different health areas. We're sort of defining this slightly different um, for each of the different areas because what we really wanted to do is look at the last price paid before a product reaches a consumer. And so that perspective is a little bit different depending on what that is. So within contraception, within the public sector, we're looking at the um, costs that institutional purchasers are paying for supplies with the assumption that in most cases, so we know not all that those are then um, being distributed for free to women through the public sector. And then within the private sector, we're looking at sort of out-of-pocket expenditure at the point of sale to consumer. So drawing on um, retail outlet surveys and different data sources that give us information about um, the price that is paid. Within uh, menstrual hygiene, because we know uh, most menstrual hygiene products are purchased um, by users out-of-pocket, we are again focusing on that sort of out-of-pocket consumer price, and there's some more information. Uh, we purchased some uh, data from the Markets to Markets report to get some information about uh, consumer prices of different products uh, in, in different countries and regions. For abortion and PAC, um, there, we are mostly drawing on um, data from IPPF's uh, medical database for um, medical methods which capture prices that consumers pay at retail um, outlets. And then for maternal health, because we know that not while not all maternal health services are, or drugs are purchased uh, by public sector or institutional procurers, that a lot of those, um, a lot of that is where they are coming from. And, and therefore we have used um, UNICEF list prices for these. We know that there's quite a lot of variation in the prices paid, especially when governments are procuring the drugs, but that data is very limited. So we have made a choice, at least right now, um, to use a, a single price point. Maybe one thing I will say too is that, you know, we, as John mentioned, there is a very, very long history um, of the contraceptive uh, commodity gap analysis. But for these new health areas, this is really a first step into these areas. And so we really see this work as a beginning and we look forward to you know, using feedback 
from the community and, and more data as it becomes increasingly available to continue to refine the estimates that we're making in these new health areas. Let me just quickly peek um, at some questions. Um, maybe I will start by passing over to Nicole. Um, there was uh, some questions around, uh, oh, it looks like these were responded to in the chat, but maybe give you a second if others didn't see that to maybe talk some about the availability of data, maybe both on price, but also in terms of use and what we are able to find and use. Yeah, thanks. Um, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, really, there is a lot of limits to some of the data that's available on menstrual hygiene, but I think the good news is that data seem to be um, becoming more available over time. It seems like a lot of the data were uh, fairly recent. Um, and I think that there's been an emphasis on this is an area that's been neglected in terms of information. And um, I'm anticipating more information coming out in the coming years. Um, as Michelle mentioned, we had data on price prices from the Markets and Markets uh, report, um, included some low and middle income countries, um, which we used, um, but there's certainly um, a lot more data that we could be using for, for refining that. Um, you'll see in table two of the menstrual hygiene report where we've um, displayed the, the unit the unit prices um, by region, um, and that's based largely on that report. Um, we did not have a lot of variability in terms of the reusables, um, because as I mentioned before, there's there's really a lack of data in that in that um, side of menstrual hygiene. Um, but again, we're hopeful that more data will be coming available in the coming years, and that revisions of this report or updates. Um, can can capitalize on more data coming forward. Great. Um, so there is a question about scenario one. I think this was asked about um, uh, the abortion impact, but this is uh, holds true across all of the um, uh, all of the the three new health areas. Um, so in scenario one, we're accounting for demographic changes. Um, so allowing that influence of shifts in contraceptive use, um, affecting unintended pregnancy and, and kind of building in other demographic changes, but then just holding constant the coverage and use of those new service areas. So of menstrual hygiene, the share of women using purpose-made products is held constant um, in uh, abortion and PAC, the the types of services and the methods used are held constant. And then in maternal health, the coverage um, of different maternal health services is held constant. And then in scenarios two and three, those same demographics underlie those scenarios, but then we layer in the changes in coverage of the different health interventions. Um, I see there was a question about um, the potential impact of new contraceptive method introduction. Um, we have not captured this um, because our, our methodology was sort of driven on building a picture of the future if um, recent changes were to persist. Um, so if that introduction, if that method introduction was sort of already happening and we were already seeing in the data sort of shifts in method mix that would incorporate that, um, then that would um, that would be um, picked, picked up. Um, but if there was sort of new plans to introduce and scale methods that weren't yet kind of showing in the data, then um, our projected trends would not be picking those up. And again, our, our kind of scenario for contraception was meant to say, you know, if our, if current trends, if recent changes in method mix persisted, where would things be? And recognizing, of course, that there are lots of different um, kind of reasons on the supply side and the demand side that might um, mean that those don't continue to persist. Just scrolling to see what other questions. It looks like a lot have been answered in the chat box, which is great. 
Um, there is a question about population growth estimates. Um, so for, um, we are uh, aligning at least initially our estimates um, and so for contraception and for maternal health, uh, our population estimates are aligned with the median variant for, from the UN POP division. For uh, abortion and PAC and maternal health, we've created our own estimates um, using the uh, spectrum software, the DEMPROGE and the FAM plan models so that we can account for the shifts in contraceptive use and the shifts in method mix that we modeled for LEAP and how the, those will then impact um, changes in the number of um, pregnancies uh, and births and abortions that happen. And so though that, mod that modeling uh, in the base year is aligned to UN population projections, but then because we're kind of building in our own shifts, um, we diverge a bit from them, but they are um, fairly similar to what we see in those. Um, Rachel, do you want to maybe respond? Mark has just put a question in our comments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's very true. While it's um, while it might kind of create the impression that the need is low, we do need to emphasize that in terms of maternal mortality, the responsibility to ensure that those supplies are available is important in order to be able to reduce maternal mortality because it is quite a bit higher still in those regions. So thank you for the point, well taken. And I will say, and I know this has come up in past uh, discussions of the commodity gap analysis as well. Um, you know, I, I think there's, in sort of building this global or this low and middle income country picture, right, of course, it is very shaped by, um, by one, a few large countries, as we saw um, from those pie charts, and then also very shaped um, by what kind of income group those countries sit in. And I think both perspectives are really important. And that's why throughout the report, we've sort of had this toggling between um, absolute and relative in our various graphs, right? Because if you're thinking about, you know, what is, what is the market for a particular drug and how many units might need need to be produced or could be used or utilized in, in that view, um, you know, that absolute view, which is accounting for differences in population across different countries and across different income groups is really important. But if we want to talk more about sort of needs within a particular income group or within a particular country is where I think that relative view can be helpful as well. And so I think by, um, making sure that we're, we're sort of constantly looking at the data in both of those ways and that depending on the kind of questions that we have or the kind of advocacy statements or, or things that we want to get from it that a different way of thinking about it and looking at it um, might, be, might be needed. And maybe just one other clarification in the maternal health section, the need is based on, um, on cases where, or maybe Rachel, I'll pass over to you to, if you want to jump in on, on sort of why we use um, cases needing versus demand for um, within the maternal health section. Oh, you're on mute, Rachel. Thank you. Um, as the starting point for the analysis, we do rely on absolute need rather than demand because demand will play out in as part of the coverage estimate. Um, as I see in the chat, the note, many women in low income countries need these supplies and that's absolutely true. And that's why kind of the starting point and the perspective that we take is the target population, births or pregnancies, the proportion of those births or pregnancies that need or should get the supplies, followed by a layering on of an annual level of coverage, which will reflect both 
demand, supply, and a whole host of other factors. And so I think we are probably saying something similar in that we assume that absolute need is not defined by demand or supply, but rather by the set of conditions and numbers of pregnancies of births that are taking place in these countries. So I think that your comments are pushing us to emphasize that a bit more. It might not have been clear in the presentation. Um, so we thank you for, for raising them. I will say, I think the, the maternal health section of this report was probably the most challenging in that, right? We have this range of drugs that are used for a range of different conditions and, you know, some are, are needed by all, right? Like iron folic acid supplementation is recommended for all women. So that's very straightforward, but others are only needed for women who will experience certain conditions. And so sort of, um, teasing out all those complexities to think about what, how do we look at and, and talk about what the needs are. And that's why we really ended up on this terminology of cases so that we could sort of put all these different things together, but be able to collectively talk about instances in which a pregnant woman or a woman who is giving birth um, would need um, a different service or a different drug, and then compare that to when they're actually receiving it based on coverage levels. Michelle, there's a question about has the use data been mapped with actual supplies? And I know that really varies across the different areas. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, maybe I can start on contraception and then Megan, you can maybe talk a little bit about looking at um, some data, uh, especially around that MA. Um, so we have, uh, so for, the contraceptive analysis, um, we have done some comparison, um, especially within the private sector in trying to estimate the, the role of subsidy within the private sector. We've looked at volumes um, coming from the DKT social marketing statistics, as well as data shared um, by different organizations to see, to sort of understand sort of how those volumes um, map to our volume estimates within the private sector, mainly using that to try to untangle what we think the role of subsidy is, because we don't really have sort of comprehensive um, volume estimates within the private sector. On the public sector side, we have also done some comparisons to sort of look at procurement volumes um, compared with, with our estimates, though recognizing that for many reasons, we would not expect these to match, right? The volume procured, represents um, what is needed to fill supply chains, to, to plan for future changes, to ensure a wide range of methods are available. And so those volumes um, are, are often larger or in some cases lower than what's sort of uh, used by women in a given year. And so we've done a little bit of mapping, but it's, it's difficult to sort of precisely um, do that for all of those reasons. And then I may ask Megan to talk a little bit about a similar process. Uh, especially around medical abortion. Yep, um, so yeah, so as, as you said, um, we mostly did this around medical abortion, um, specifically using some of the same data sources that you were referencing. Um, so we started with um, uh, method mix estimates from the Guttmacher Institute's Adding It Up report and used that to sort of set our initial distribution for baseline. Um, but then we took um, data from the DKT's um, social marketing statistics report and you know, looked at uh, particularly levels of combi packs and combination and other combinations of um, misoprostol and mifepristone because um, we found that the initial estimates from the adding it up report were kind of underestimating um, the levels of um, mifepristone that we were actually seeing. Um, in terms of those statistics. So we adjusted um, actually our baseline estimates to take into consideration what we were seeing in actual supplies available. Great. Uh, so I see that we are um, at time and we wanna respect everybody's time this morning. So we just like to thank everybody um, for joining us. Um, as I said, you know, this is our, our 
kind of starting point uh, going, expanding into these new health areas. And we really uh, look forward to feedback from the community to help us uh, continue to push this work forward. And John, I might leave it to you to give us a final parting thought before we say goodbye. Thank you, Michelle. I trying to get the video on. Anyway, thank you, Michelle. It was a, a fascinating presentation. And, uh, you know, I want to thank you and, and, and the team for, for, for really putting together this uh, masterful piece of work. Um, it will grow, it will evolve over time. And, and our hope is to be able to, to update in this in, in the years to come. Uh, we had a great turnout during the webinar today. Um, and so I'd like to thank everybody uh, who joined to join with us. Um, so thank you very much and uh, have a good weekend. Bye.